I'll take you through briefly some of the elements of our ADL system for entry, descent, and landing. We start prior to the atmosphere of Mars, about 13,000 miles an hour. And we are at this point, we separate the cruise stage and prepare for running into the atmosphere of Mars. It's a bit of an impact. We will pull about 10 Earth Gs or more of acceleration during our first contact with the, uh, with the Martian atmosphere. During that time, we're employing something called guided entry, which I'll speak a little bit about later. But we'll be using our, our reaction control jets, which you can see in this video occasionally firing at the back of the spacecraft to uh, help Curiosity steer her way through the atmosphere. After we've gone through that hypersonic entry phase, we adjust the attitude of the spacecraft by throwing off some masses and prepare for parachute deploy. We open this parachute a little bit less than Mach 2, uh, or about 1,000 miles an hour at Mars. We open up the world's largest supersonic uh, parachute, 21 meter diameter parachute, and then almost immediately remove the heat shield and start looking for the ground. At about a mile above the surface, we will have seen the ground with a custom-made radar, landing radar, and we will let go of the parachute and use our eight Mars landing engines, also developed purposefully for Curiosity. We'll use those rocket engines to slow us from about 200 miles an hour down to about one and a half miles an hour, or three quarters of a meter a second, and in straight vertical flight. We're in that straight vertical flight for the last 200 meters or so, looking straight down on where we're gonna land. And then 20 meters before we land, we separate the, the, the rover below the descent stage, and the two together continue at that one and a half miles an hour down gently towards the surface until Curiosity herself, is weight is taken up by the terrain of Mars. At this point, we cut the descent stage free, and it flies off to a safe distance to impact the surface. Leaving Curiosity, wheels down on the Martian terrain, ready to begin its surface mission. Now there are two key novel pieces to this entry, descent, and landing architecture. The first is guided entry, and I mentioned that. I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through a bit of it. Historically, the landing footprint that our missions has had have been 100 kilometers or more of landing uncertainty when we go to select the site that we're going to. Well, it's quite hard to find safe sites to land that are that size. Curiosity uses guided entry to shrink that from 100 kilometers or so down to something a skosh less than 20 kilometers of uncertainty. To do that, we take our entry capsule. We have some masses, about one MER's rover worth of tungsten in six ports out here. And when she flies through the atmosphere of Mars, because of these weights, she flies at a canted angle. That canted angle develops lift. She then uses the reaction control jets here to turn that lift vector forward and backwards, up and down, to control her descent through the atmosphere and remove both errors in delivery and, more importantly, the uncertainty of the atmosphere that we may encounter on the day we land. That's always been traditionally a big question mark. What atmosphere are we going to find when we come in? This system allows us to be robust to a large range of those possible atmospheres. The second big novelty is the way that we touch Curiosity down to the ground, the touchdown system or landing system. 20 meters above the surface, Curiosity still has her jet backpack, the descent stage, strapped to her. She's in vertical flight. And at this point, she lowers, she's lowered by the descent stage as they both continue downward. She's lowered down on a seven and a half meter bridle. And the two together slowly make their way down 
until her weight is taken up by the train of Mars. At this point, with Curiosity safely on the surface, and after we've acknowledged that the weight is gone, the descent stage cuts itself free and flies away. Uh, it looks a little bit crazy. I, I promise you it is the least crazy of the methods you could use to, to <laughs> land a, a rover the size of Curiosity on Mars. And we've become quite fond of it. And we're fairly confident that, that Sunday night will be a good night for us. Curiosity is not a life detection mission. We're not actually looking for life. We don't have the ability to detect life if it was there. What we are looking for is the ingredients of life. The Mars Science Laboratory takes this Curiosity rover with this incredible set of uh, payload instruments to figure out if Mars ever could have supported uh, microbial life. By that we mean a place where microorganisms, little tiny single-celled organisms, could have lived and that requires a source of energy and water uh, because all life as we know it is associated with water. And then we also need a source of carbon. Curiosity is going to land at Gale Crater. And we're going to be climbing a mountain. In fact, one of the first things we'll see when we wake up the first day on Mars is this giant mountain in front of us, just waiting for us a few miles away. And in that mountain, there's a stack of layers. And like turning the pages in a book, we will explore these layers and look at them in terms of whether or not they preserve evidence for ancient habitable environments. So you can think of Spirit and Opportunity as robotic geologists. Curiosity goes one step further. It's not only a robotic geologist, but a robotic geochemist. We need a bigger rover this time around because we've got 10 science instruments and two of them fit inside of the belly of the rover. We bring some state-of-the-art laboratories to do very detailed geochemical analysis of the rocks and soils on Mars, and the atmosphere as well. We have to feed those instruments by getting samples of rock with a big robotic arm and a drill on the end of it. And then we, of course, want to have all of our eyes and the other senses that we need with cameras and other detectors to monitor the weather and other things as well. The reason it's important to have this capability is this brings us back to how we address the question and search for habitable environments again. We need to make those measurements in order to know that if life had evolved on Mars, would this be the kind of place where microorganisms could have lived? When people look at it, sometimes when we look at it, it looks crazy. It is the result of reasoned engineering thought. But it still looks crazy. From the top of the atmosphere, down to the surface, it takes us seven minutes. It takes 14 minutes or so for the signal from the spacecraft to make it to Earth. That's how far Mars is away from us. So when we first get word that we've touched the top of the atmosphere, the vehicle has been alive or dead on the surface for at least seven minutes. Entry, descent, and landing also known as EDL, is referred to as the seven minutes of terror because we've got literally seven minutes to get from the top of the atmosphere to the surface of Mars, going from 13,000 miles an hour to zero in perfect sequence, perfect choreography, perfect timing, and the computer has to do it all by itself with no help from the ground. It, if any one thing doesn't work just right, it's game over. We slam into the atmosphere and develop so much aerodynamic drag. Our heat shield, it heats up and it glows like the surface of the sun. 1600 degrees. During entry, the vehicle is not only slowing down violently through the atmosphere, but also we are guiding it like an airplane to be able to land in a very narrow constraint space. This is one of the biggest challenges that we are facing and one that we had never attempted on Mars. Mars is actually really hard to slow down. 
because it has just enough atmosphere that you have to deal with it. Otherwise, it will destroy your spacecraft. On the other hand, it doesn't have enough atmosphere to finish the job. We're still going about 1,000 miles an hour. So at that point, we use a parachute. The parachute is the largest and strongest supersonic parachute that we've ever built to date. It has to be able to withstand 65,000 pounds of force, even though the parachute itself only weighs about 100 pounds. When it opens up that fast, it's a neck snapping 9Gs. At that point, we have to get that heat shield off. It's like a big lens cap blocking our view of the ground to the radar. The radar has to take just the right altitude and velocity measurements at just the right time, or the rest of the landing sequence won't work. This big, huge parachute that we've got, it will only slow us down to about 200 miles an hour. And that's not slow enough to land. So we have no choice, but we've got to cut it off and then come down in rockets. Once we turn those rocket motors on, if we don't do something, we're just going to smack right back into the parachute. So the first thing we do is make this really radical divert maneuver. We fly off to the side. Diverting away from the parachute, killing our horizontal velocity and our vertical velocity, getting the rover moving straight up and down so it can look at the surface with its radar and see where we're going to land. And we head straight down to the bottom of a crater right beside a six kilometer high mountain. We can't get those rocket engines too close to the ground because if we were to descend propulsively with our engines all the way to the ground, we would essentially create this massive dust cloud. That dust cloud could then go and land on the rover. It could damage mechanisms and it could damage instruments. So the way we solve that problem is by using the sky crane maneuver. 20 meters above the surface, we have to lower the rover below us on a tether that's 21 feet long and then gently deposit it on its wheels on the surface. As the rover touches down and is now on the ground, the descent stage is in a collision course with the rover. We must cut the bridle immediately and fly the descent stage to a safe distance from the rover. 